What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Fudge Mopper. This is the Elder Scrolls Podcast. I'm Scott here with Michael and Drew, as always, and we are back with more of your guys' hot, spicy takes that we've sort of gathered from YouTube. And last time we asked for them, we've still got so many to go through. We only got through, like, I feel like six or (laughs) ten or something like that. (laughs) So there's so many to go through. So bear with us as we sort of, like... You know look through them on the fly we've been building I, up the temperature there's been some room temp takes getting mm. into a little bit of australian summer maybe but it hasn't gotten that hot yet not yet no. well here's we can start off with one that's just <laughs> i'm gonna disagree with immediately but it's fine so from uh rosie muscovy uh tez games were never that good they're carried by their modding scenes, and Bethesda is fully aware of it, which is going to be subs- uh, to subsequently result in The Elder Scrolls Six being a shell of a game, because why put effort into your game when your modders will do it for free anyways? No. I-, I mean, look, I've seen this take before. Like, I've actually seen this take a lot, and it's because the modders in The Elder Scrolls scene are so good, mm. right? Like, they are good. They do help people get longevity out of the games. But... I don't know about everyone else watching, but I personally played a lot of Elder Scrolls with zero mods Mm. for a very long time. Like, I mean, back in the day, I didn't even have a PC. Yeah. I I would play, like, my thousands of hours of Skyrim on an Xbox 360. This this is kind of like the nature of fandom, you know? It's a bit rich coming from me because I can be a bit of a contrarian sometimes, but you get in communities that have been around for long enough, you get... It becomes cool to hate on things... But then if you get to the point where you're hating on the very concept of the thing that you're a fan of in the first place, it's getting a bit ridiculous. Like, yeah. why, why are you in this community if you think Tez games are that bad? <laughs> it's like, let's be honest, we all love them, even if we're going to take the piss out of some things about them. And to yeah. say that, Sky- like, you know, just to use Skyrim as an example, to say Skyrim isn't a great game when it's vanilla. Like, we all played it vanilla for so long. Bef- and then mods gave it that extra life. I will say it is a hot take. It is a very hot take. But then again, the only thing I would say maybe it's a little less hot is because I could see a few, like I'll put my eyes down. It's like, oh, Marshall Beck, Skyrim was overrated from the start. It didn't improve on anything in the series. And I'm just like, I feel like Skyrim... <laughs> Dude, that's ha- a hot take as Skyrim well. hate in general is, I feel like is so common. And I've got, it's going to be so funny to live through to Elder Scrolls 6 and then look at Elder Scrolls 6 and then Skyrim's all of a sudden like, whoa, back in the day, Skyrim was mm-hmm. based. It was the best back then. Man, Elder Scrolls 6 didn't improve on anything in the series. <laughs> and like, it's got to be like that every time. It's like, obviously there, there are, there are pros and cons to each um, one. And then it's like some changes that we aren't happy with, but there's other things that you completely underestimate and so on um or you just Mm -hmm. take for granted because you're not really looking at it by comparison from oblivion to skyrim or or whatnot yeah for sure but yeah um let's have a look this isn't i don't know if this is hot but uh air jitsu studios the thieves guild has the best quest line out of all the guilds and i'm assuming it's talking about skyrim um Oh, what if he's talking across all of the games? Um, I just said... Well, he says the best quest line out of all guilds. But there's two... I mean, I don't know fair. if that's hot take. Yeah, it feels... Yeah. Like, I am no, I know everyone wouldn't agree with it. But I'm sure that a lot of people would. Because they are solid. I mean, even in Skyrim, I'd say it does. I think it's better than the Dark Brotherhood's quest line, personally. You reckon? I, I, I mean, I have more memorable moments from that than the Dark Brotherhood, yeah. personally. I mean, look, N- Nightingale armor was pretty cool, mm. but... Um, like, meeting Nocturnal as and the, the confrontation yeah. with Mercer was all pretty good. Yeah. Mm. I think the Thieves' Guild in Skyrim was a really cool plotline. The, the problem, for me at least, as I've talked about before, is that it wasn't thiefy enough for me in terms of the main quests. I know there were the kind of side radiant quests you did to become the Thieves' Guild master, but... For me personally, I like how in like Oblivion, from the start, your main missions with their own unique little stories are all like steal this or Mm -hmm. go here or infiltrate. Like they're not go beat up people in Riften and then get caught up in the internal politics of of the game. Yeah, it's more of a story than living the life of a thief. Yeah. But that said, there are a lot of problems of similar nature in Skyrim. So... 
Except I say the Dark Brotherhood is, you know, it is go and kill, kill people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's not a perfect plot line, but it, you are an assassin, yeah. which is cool. Yeah. What do you think, Scott? Like, what would you say is the best guild storyline? Because it's um, not the Mage's Guild. And the companions, if you take out being a werewolf, it's not the companions. Yeah, like, no. that. the, the companions are carried by, oh my gosh, werewolf form. If it's out of all the guilds, I'm, sometimes I kind of lean to Dark Brotherhood just because mm, there was that's lots of memorable characters. I think assassinating the Emperor is a pretty cool peak for it. Um, and, uh, you know, like... The memorable characters and assassinations and stuff like it's always a little like bit of the fun. the wedding the wedding one was pretty mm. fun yeah uh, yeah I can put but them around I do I do also do, to be honest actually if you really break it down I think that in Skyrim uh, the Thieves Guild and Dark Brother would have the better characters and that makes them far more memorable too like you remember Brynjolf you remember Carlisle you remember Eve, even Mercer Frey as an enemy like um, and you know Delvin Mallory and all of those kinds of people and in the Dark yep. Brotherhood you remember like the werewolf dude um, the guy that was a werewolf I forgot his <laughs> actual name doesn't even know his name, name. he's but, so memorable <laughs> but yeah I, I don't actually <laughs> but like you know Babette and so on and there's the Dark Elf chick that tells you about like you know killing a unicorn with a needle and yeah, like yeah. He, they, I think the Thieves Guild characters were actually the most memorable like mm-hmm. easily because I remember their names yeah and they had the bar scene going for them which was kind of like unique by default yeah like as, as much as the ragged flagon is something my brain is so used to if you take it at its base concept it's it's cool hmm it's a cool I, hideout I think it's it's something that like Elder Scrolls does well anyway it's the greatness or like enjoyment from a lot of Elder Scrolls is the sum of parts, not the parts. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like that individual quest isn't the most amazing thing you're going to experience in gaming or that individual character or whatever, but it's the sum of all of it and the ability to kind of like do all of it or experience it different ways is really what Elder Scrolls strength is. Because then I think that's a lot of what's a criticism that comes at Elder Scrolls games and so on is they go like, oh, well, you know, Witcher does X better, or this does X better, or yada, yada, yada. But, like, it's the sum of everything in the package that is, like, Skyrim or whatever that obviously um, Mm. is very popular for. You know what would actually be really cool? This is a bit of a side thought, but just thinking of how well Witcher did random characters for side quests. Like, Mm. I remember playing it and everyone felt very real. Like, when you... I know the cutscene kind of conversation format helps with that, but... You know, you would go and talk to some farmer whose, who's, you know, wife is missing or something. But it just felt real. Like, he felt like a real person. Like, his house felt lived in. Like, it just... I don't know. There was something very immersive about it for me. Whereas, when I play an Elder Scrolls game, it feels very much more like, I've lost my family sword. Yeah. Go retrieve it. Like, it didn't... It, I think someone actually said this in the last hot takes episode something about lacking emotion yeah do you remember that yeah maybe maybe that's what it is maybe the voice actors need to like draw me in make me really convinced like because for example even the the way the kids talk is very stereotypical like like i don't know if this is a quote but like are you my daddy or (laughs) they say these things you know when they're standing there they say all kinds of like very cliche things or like it's very wooden it feels like a bit more constructed like and i think it's also game design thing it's like uh elder scrolls is built generally to have these characters so you can do things around them or or like play around with it and so on but it's witcher's constructing lots of little stories into a big story because the story ultimately is the appeal of Witcher. And it's a lot easier to write dialogue between an NPC and a clear protagonist character that you know and also has a voice. And like we're not, wouldn't say that it's a good thing to have a voice protagonist, but you can understand why dialogue would seem much more fluid when you have two voices talking to each other. Yeah. And, you know, obviously just the variety of your characters in an Elder Scrolls game. Um, I've got another hot take Uh-oh. from uh, Shiranui Raccoon. Uh, the leveling up by leveling skill system is actually pretty bad. It's a cool twist on the XP formula, but ends up doing more harm than good. It limits your progression based on the race you chose, a Khajiit 
For example, having 10 more points in Stealth and Archery will cap out faster than an Orc in Stealth Archery. It's very easy to exploit, punishes you for not min-maxing your skills in the first levels, discourages experimentation by making you atrociously bad at the skill you're low level with, and makes you reliant on trainers so you can keep improving the skills you don't actually use. Having skill ranks is great, I just think your actual level should be improved in another way. Maybe a Fallout New Vegas style could do wonders. I mean, I actually really like the way that Fallout has handled quests and XP. I um, Because uh, yeah, there, there are heaps of problems with the Elder Scrolls format, like heaps. And that's why when people say, oh, in a future Fallout game, we should have level by doing. I'm like, no, like, absolutely not. But in the same way, I don't think I can ever see Elder Scrolls switching to that just because the level by doing system is so loved by fans. I mean, I like it. It's it, I, I, But I'm also aware that there are these issues. Yeah, there's an immersion um, part part of it that really like sells it but i have i have seen it done differently in other ways that i enjoy more as well than i do even the elder scrolls version like i've seen in um uh bannerlord 2 the way it sort of works is you have like all of your skills and then you have like little points at the bottom like like five bars and basically like each bar you fill up you spend a skill point on um i think it marginally increases the skill but it increases the rate at which you learn the skill so it increases, so like, so say if you have, you know, five in um, Swordsman or whatever, and you pump it really early, you will then like get that like um, speed up or one-handed or whatever it's called. You will level up. So imagine if you got like Alteration or so on, you start off, but then you start pumping points into Alteration and increases the rate that you actually increase your Alteration skill at. Mm -hmm. I don't, I kind of enjoy that, but maybe that's also just like, it's that specific kind of game. Like as a general rule, I do prefer like the whole like traditional sort of, XP mm -hmm. formula and the reason being too is it's it keeps you engaged in doing the game so like like for example you going in, in New Vegas you doing quests and engaging in combat and, and doing that kind of stuff or discovering new places it rewards you for that in XP theoretically you can run through an entire um, quest line and not gain any XP in Skyrim. For example, if you've maxed out your one-handed and heavy armor and block, you run the companion's quest line or something like that, you're not, you've kind of got a natural cap. You're doing all of this stuff, theoretically getting more experience, but you're actually not getting any level back or any skill because you're not using those things. So, Agreed. Uh, yeah. Um, Agreed. So sometimes, and then it can encourage that kind of grinding thing. Well, it's like, I'm going to sit here and train that thing. And it's like on paper, you know, sometimes there's cool experiences with it. But a lot of the time it really does come the, down the to reality a grind. Is, yeah, the reality is you end up standing in front of a giant with his mammoths, holding a shield in one hand and a restoration spell in the other, mm -hmm. wearing a certain brand of armor to train three skills. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, like, at least that's what I end up doing at the higher levels because you can't level up anymore yep. unless you go out of... Well, actually, the legendary system kind of addressed that a bit because you could let, like... Yeah. You yeah. could start with skills again. So, in a way that, but that I was, guess... You know, but that was kind of weird in itself, too. It like, was weird. The way that worked. It's like, oh, you're a master at destruction and now you're not. Start again. And yeah, it's, it's like, like Call of Duty prestiging mm -hmm. or something. It just doesn't, <laughs> yeah. quite, it doesn't quite work. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they could do it without having to actually start again somehow. Like your damage doesn't go up, but you somehow get more experience so you could still level. Yeah. Mm. I, I, um, it's, it's a weird, uh, there's already in my head, all these different balances and checks that you'd need to look, I guess here's the conclusion to that one. There's no perfect system. Um, there will always be a trade-off, whether that trade-off is immersion or, at some point, you know, your character, things can feel a bit out of balance and you need to address that. But yeah, I, um, it's, it is what it is. Yeah. I hope like, look, the fact is they're going to keep it for Elder Scrolls six. Um, I don't, I don't mind it. Like I enjoy it. Like, but I do think other systems are still better. Anything that combines the, the actual experience of leveling up and all of that combines it with the, the core of what your game is, I guess, is, um, far more interesting, you know? like doing quests and so on. And, you know. It also provides, I think, for some more interesting scenarios when and if they do add more choice to quests. Yeah. Like for like instead of just thinking of reward, you could think like, oh, if I go and do the quest this way, which perhaps is like a evil way or more evil way, maybe there's more opportunity for me to get more XP because it sounds really intense and difficult rather than just doing 
the yeah. good guy thing and handing in the quest early. The other thing too is like the, with a Fallout New Vegas sort of system, it does allow you to role play easier because there are some skills that just aren't really feasible outside of, you know, having to grind them up or something. It's not really feasible to use them as much. Like for example, um, the science skill in Fallout like helps you with computers and so on. But there's not enough computers to like train that mm -hmm. skill. And then so by the time it's like, imagine if you had to do basically, you know, hack every single computer in the game to get it to like, you know, to 90 or something. And now you're at uh -huh. 90, you know, science uh, and there's no yeah. computers left to hack. Like, why do you have the skill? I've never heard somebody argue that well. Every time I hear it, like, oh, we should be able to do science and stuff to level up. I'm just like... Different games, man. Different games. Yeah. It, it's generally... I mean, it, even the fact that you can allocate... Like, that's a good thing about Fallout is that you can allocate skill points so that you can become, like, you know, you can max science really early so that um, game developers can actually put a computer that needs 80 science in some early game area. And that's kind of like a special moment for that character. Otherwise... It would just be like, oh, we're going to put all of the high science things in the high level places and, and they'll do that for lock picking. You know what I mean? Like, it's cool yeah. to have that scenario. I mean, like, even in Fallout 4, wasn't the the um, the um cryo gun. I forget the name of it. Yeah. You know, in the it, vault, there's that cryo gun that you can cryo come back and the cryolator. Yeah. I can't even remember if that needs... 100 I think it was or, 75, but that's a big deal. If you it, want to it's get impossible it to get it at the start, but you can get yeah, back yeah, there yeah. earlier, basically. Yeah. yeah. Or you can use some glitch with dog meat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have him take it. All right. Here's one from Obedient Doormat. Uh, the nice. idea of an Orsinium is boring. What makes orcs interesting is the fact that they are tribalistic slash nomadic and are scattered everywhere. I think the, the problem with that is in saying it's boring to have them attempt to do something different is like, so wait, your solution to that is for them to never do anything different to their initial culture. I think the, the what makes Orsinium interesting is not that they're building a city and they're trying to live a cosmopolitan lifestyle. It's the fact that they're doing that against all of, you know, all of their culture and all of the, um, the Im impressions that the other races have on them. So it's like, it doesn't detract from stronghold culture to have Orsinium as well. And I think too, if you kind of, re if you just imagine there is no like Orsinium never was, and it's just always just tribal orcs and so on. Um, it removes the sort of like uh, dynamism of, of the culture that there's like different ideas emerge and here mm -hmm. comes Gortwog and he's got this idea of bringing together everyone under Trinimac mm -hmm. and, and you kind of remove the culture. It's like making everything sort of one note. It's like if every single elf on the Somerset Isles was exactly Thalmor, like most stereotypical, they could become boring or, you know, you want that sort of... Even the doom to fail aspect of it gets removed, which is kind of interesting that... Because it's not like yeah. if Orsinium exists, strongholds don't. You can have mm -hmm. both. But this idea that they constantly throughout the timeline have tried to build this Orsinium and like things keep going wrong for them. And then, you know, there'll be this whole idea when they build the next one, like what's going to go wrong now? Because this has never stood the test of time, you know? And yeah. I, I, I feel like that even makes them resilient in a way. And it's interesting that they're so resilient and adamant about trying again. And like personally, I, I just think it's so cool that you um, that Orsinium the, the kind of like there's that dynamic between the sort of tribal orcs and, and the sort of Malakath kind of thing, but they're trying to sort of resurrect the sort of idea of Trinamak, the sort of pre-corruption kind of thing, and that becomes like the champion figurehead of this sort of civilization or what they could be. I just kind of like that sort of um, dynamic as well. Mm. But I think if it was just you know Malakath orcs running around. Um, I don't know. Contrast is good. It's good in cultures to have cultures that aren't one note because then ultimately they become not too distinguished from goblins, really, or something like that, you know? Um, mm. I, I, I heard some... I saw some random theory that I can't even remember what the details of it were, but since we're talking about orcs, I was like, that's a, that's a bit weird, but also interesting. Someone was like, um, the reason orcs have tusks is because... Malakath is so scared of being betrayed again that he doesn't want his people to be able to kiss. So the idea is that they would get mm. their, like the betrayal of Boethia disguising and eating you if you're capable of kissing, which in a way suggests the theory that perhaps Boethia seduced Trinamac as opposed to fighting him, and that's how he uh, that's how she consumes him. 
Mm. I was like, oh, okay, I didn't actually read it fully, but it was an interesting theory about why yeah, they have a, tusks. That's a neat, that's a neat little uh, idea there. Hmm. Um, yeah. Some of the, like, I, I actually, just, just to throw this out here, I, I just want to find it. Um, yeah. Uh, All Hack 1982. Fudge Muppet, why can't your fan base understand the simple concept of hot takes? And then underneath it, a lot of these takes are, are lukewarm at best. But it is kind that's of not true. not a very like, hot take from him, though, is it? No, it's <laughs> not a hot true. take from him. Yeah. But, but there is like... Um, there's like like this kind like anything of like this William uh, Lazenby Bethesda has a lazy writing staff and lacks imagination and creativity they only know how to write fetch quests and are not engaging or whatever but like that's that's not a hot tag you go on any forum or anything and it's like everyone just braids that kind of thing I mean, I, uh-huh. I think in part three, we definitely like, even if we write some of our own, try to come up with the hottest takes that we can still somewhat justify. Something unique as well. Like mm. not the typical, cause it's got, it's not just hot means bad or like burn or something like that. Like it's hot as in like, mm, that's really spicy. There's some kick in there. Like that's controversial. Yeah, you want to annoy some that, people in the process. It, it, yeah, but not just taking the obvious side of being anti mm-hmm. something, because yeah. then it's like you have an army of people who agree. It's kind of just different sides. Be the the third party that that's kind of like I think this is all stupid, and here's my really unique opinion. But make sure it's genuine. Like, don't just make. I mean, you could make stuff up if it's funny, but we'll never know. This I might regret reading this one because it's long, <laughs> and I'm seeing some words I've <laughs> never heard of. Uh-oh. But um. But the opening statement is interesting enough to read, at least. So it's uh, Kel, uh, Kel Audi. The Thalmor are absolutely right in destroying the world, not just from a Tez perspective, <laughs> but also from an IRL one. Why is that? Okay, so just brace yourself. From an IRL one? Okay, go yeah. on. So hold on. Because let's say there is a bottle made of some kind of particle. Let's call it Gibeon. But the, law, uh, but the laws of physics state that this particle may never be observed, no matter how much science progresses. No matter what kind of technology we develop, we will never get to interact with it. However, it does exist, and in fact, this gibbon bottle exists at all times next to the reader that is reading this. But the reader will never see it, never touch it, never interact it, with it or uh, know about it in any kind of way. Now, does the existence of the gibbon bottle matter? Since it will never be observed or will never interact with any living thing, it might as well not exist. It just happens to exist in the same coordinates as the reader does, but from its own perspective as well, uh, all it sees is null. It's only uh, it's only the bottle in an eternity of nothingness. But where does the scale of the gibbon bottle end? Does gibbon the house matter? Does a gibbon earth? An entire universe made out of gibbonous matters if there is nothing to observe i'm regretting reading this one i I had regret from the moment you began yeah the only reason the universe matters is because we're here to observe it by that i mean all living things now on the other hand if we're all if we're all conscious to be clumped together (laughs) the the point where you start just reading to yourself and not even to us anymore yeah you've lost it Uh, hold on Try and summarize that point. Okay, really, to be honest, this was a really convoluted way of trying to explain. So the end part was saying, like, this clearly means that matter and the demiurge is nothing more than a prison, IRL as well, and we should all strive to return to it. So basically, he's just declaring, I'm a Gnostic IRL, and Gnosticism is a good thing, and basically, like, undoing the world or whatever is a good thing because mortality is a prison. Like, like a lot of Elder Scrolls lore anyway, like, the basic stuff is based on the sort of... Um, Gnostic sort of ideas that God is basically like a bad guy that created this world and trapped you out of this spirit kind of thing. It's exactly like that scene in Spy Kids 2 where (laughs) Steve Buscemi is living in his little hut because he's afraid of all the creatures. That's that's basically what he's saying, (laughs) right? But well, yeah, well, look at let, let's get to the essence of what he's saying. He agrees with the Thalmor's plan because I guess the idea there is that like the unmade world should be unmade. Unmade. It's just mm-hmm. basically. But isn't that like, yeah, it's a subjective idea. It's not like this objective, there, like, yeah. it is 100% a prison that's inherently bad. Well, it, ch- right? it changes depending on what your values are. Like, a prison just being, like, really, when you boil it down, is like limitations. So it's limitation of well, movement. Well, I have or limitations. Whatever. I have physics. Is physics my prison? I mean, but that's, that's kind of I'm, the yeah. argument. That's, that's kind of what they're saying is that, like, everything, any the, one of these limitations are a prison. But. I would argue you kind of lose all 
mean, when every, it's kind of like you just become one with the nothingness, I guess. Do you know what I mean? Like, or it's weird. I, I feel like I can be hyper aware of existential things and like any meaningless or anything like that. But at the end of the day, I still find it like easy to accept and then just look at myself and be like, well, I'm going to enjoy my subjective existence for what it is. It's, it's time for the like, existential dread part of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I, just, I just, I'm just not, it's not like, I don't avoid it. I'm like hyper aware of any of that. It's just like, okay, and what? Yeah, <laughs> and it's like, the, you know, there's like the whole like sort of ignorance is bliss kind of argument and everything is a reference range. Like even, even any subjectivity is all based on like, you know, you sort of the subject experiencing the thing. So if you're, if you're not aware of these outside experiences or whether this is fake or right or whatever, it's kind of like living in the matrix if it's a, if it's a very pleasurable life, it's like, is it a bad thing? It depends what you value. It's like, do you value truth more or do you value like happiness more? But like, I wouldn't necessarily go that like truth necessarily is like the highest moral good necessarily. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, because a lot of truth, I think a lot of truth would be that really cold kind of like, oh, everything's kind of meaningless or, or like, you know, nobody cares about you type vibe things. Not that that's true. I just mean that like, that's the kind of, you know, existential dread. It basically takes you to, to that sort of level. Bro, you got to hold two beliefs at the same time. You got to yeah. understand that in, in its entirety and then just be like, Nah, but <laughs> I am. That's achieving Kim. Mm. You got to achieve Kim. You got to look at the face of all that nihilistic crap, understand it, and then just, you know, Chad face, no. <laughs> and, you know, you got to live your life. Yeah. Like, it doesn't, I don't know. Like, I wouldn't say it justifies their plan. I feel like it's just like, depends what you think. Look, I think if the Thalmor came up in the real world, and they made it clear their ambition was to destroy the universe. I've got a feeling <laughs> this guy probably wouldn't join their ranks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no matter how convincing their their evidence mm -hmm. was. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll be a champion of mortality on this one. Um, anti destroy the world. <laughs> hot hot take. I don't want to destroy everything. Um, I actually have a hot take from Brazen Cyrus, and his hot take is that Imperials are his favorite race and he was a bit upset that we <laughs> ranked them so low i feel like that, that he is, says i think spice. i throw but he says i think i throw too much into the bin of imperial like the empires and cyril itself but i think mm. a case could be made i was seething during the races ranked podcast i think that's fair than being at the bottom it, it is fair because their history is arguably <clears throat> it's up there with the most interesting of all of the races I think, I think we kind of said that mm. though, didn't we? I, I mean, well, I, I know I've said it before that if you include all that, then they're very I think interesting. This is what we, maybe it was the last hot takes one or something. We were sort of getting a conversation. I was sort of suggesting maybe, and it's kind of hard to do, like we sort of said, but like, it's really hard to divorce like the race from the culture. Like if you were just talking like at races of what's interesting, it's like Argonians and Khajiit win in terms of like biology and stuff, but that's not what really factors in. Usually people aren't talking about like, you're not talking about, oh, it's so cool that Dark Elves have grey skin and red eyes and pointy ears. It's all of the culture and stuff that's around it and so on. So, to be fair to Imperials, all of that culture is very intertwined mm. um, with them. So, um, All I'm thinking of is that, that meme you put on Twitter where it was like Fallout law mm -hmm. and then it was like <laughs> Elder Scrolls law and it's like all the like flashing stuff yeah. except it's like... I don't know, one of the other races and then it's like Empire's lore and it's like flashing all through and you see like Riemann and Talos and all this stuff flying I, I, past. I, overall, I do think, I do think that's, a, that's at least a uh, hot take that most, because most would disagree with that. Like most would I, be like... I think Imperials. Oblivion and Skyrim, like without shitting on either of them, Oblivion and Skyrim did a lot to take the magic out of the race in question. So, you know, a lot of the Nor a lot of the magic about the Nords that you would have felt in, say, Morrowind, once you actually see what their uh, province is like and once the limitations of game design get put on it, it makes them it probably makes them rank lower than they would have before. And the same could be said of Oblivion with the Imperials. Yeah. And I mean, some people might say to that, they would go like, oh, well, that's the reality. If you go to a, to a game, to a, some area or someone, it's never going to be as good as you think. And that's kind of the cope they use for like ESO Somerset mm -hmm. and why it doesn't look crystalline. But it's like, that wasn't the case 
for Morrowind, for example. Yeah. It's very interesting and so on. And there's feasibly... You absolutely could. There's no reason that Skyrim couldn't be way more barbaric and Nordicish kind of feeling with the old gods and all that. Or there's no way that Cyrodiil could have been a, you know, a jungle with this kind of imperial Chinese flavor mixed with Byzantine Rome. And they've got this big economy with like rice paddies all up this jungly Nibbane Valley. And, you know, like there's no reason outside of whatever game limitation kind of stuff, but like, like at that time or whatever. But I just mean like it really is a direction change, mm-hmm. you know, so. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, I I like Imperials. It's also especially like I'm a big fan of um, Nidic, the Nibbane sort of stuff, like their earlier history. I like all of that. Like I love the idea of, and I would love to sort of see it expressed in some way or or seeing it, but I love all the stuff about the Nidic uprising with Elysia and, you know, Pelennor Morrowhouse and all that. But I love the idea that the Minotaurs are like sort of attached to old Elysian ruins because like, you know, they were protectors of the Emperor in the early days and like the the bull symbology and stuff is kind of cooler. And um, also that riffs off like kind of a lot of the significance of the bull in a lot of like Bronze Age early civilizations because it's such an important... (laughs) (laughs) I'm just laughing because there's a comment and it's like hot take... I know what Scott means. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you know, that's a, it's a real thing. Like Ant V. That, so what's a real thing? No, that, that's a, like, sorry, if, if you know what I mean. Like I say, I, I don't know when I picked this up or what happens, but now I do it all the time <laughs> compulsively, but it's a break in conversation, but it is also like opportunity to clarify or opportunity to object or opportunity to sort of like, like it's giving the other person like, like, do you know what? If you don't know what I mean, bro, if I go and like talk for another five minutes, you lost. I lost you here, but I had to give the opportunity to like. Now that you said this, it's going to be so much more noticeable for sure. But yeah, what about Strawberry Girl twenty twenty two saying hot take bad thing is actually good? <laughs> uh, I, I kind of disagree. <laughs> I feel like inherently it's bad. Uh, well, apparently that was our last video in a nutshell. Um. Uh, this is a this is a hot take really <laughs> like okay uh the changeling prince skyrim is the most faithful representation of any province i've ever seen even without the nordic pantheon it's only real misstep what do you mean by that yeah. i guess in geography which it I mean it wasn't faithful to the law it was supposed to be basically snowy everywhere and really like mm. northern sort of like you kind of like imagine like siberia rush kind of thing except the reach was supposed to be like this really fertile area which was like that's why it was so fought over by the, the needs and the elves in the past and the nords and so on in a highly contested area because it was like functionally the bread basket of skyrim mm. in older interpretations of the law and the rest was really mountainous. And- I feel like it's impossible for Skyrim or Oblivion to be the most faithful because earlier entries into the series, the game came out alongside a lot of the lore that explained the place, if that makes sense. So yeah. I'm now using your your terminology, That if that does make sense. Um, yeah. But whereas Skyrim and Oblivion, there's already a lot of... Uh, everybody knows a lot about these provinces and these races before the game comes out, so there's so much more to diverge from. But, you know, when you've got Daggerfall or Morrowind, what you get in those games is that's the way it is. Yeah. So it can't really not be faithful. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I agree. I don't think Skyrim... Um, it's a hot take, but I, I don't agree with the take. Because um, sorry, King. Yeah, because mm. man, I, I like one thing. I, I remember seeing. I think it's in the pocket mm. guide. Um, there's a like a little concept art or something, and it's like a. I think it's even a Nord with like a nail in his eye or something. But I just love the idea that there are some Nords, and it was like some Nords haven't even heard of this Septum Empire and so on, because where they are and they're so connected to the sort of like you know old ways, and they're so recluse by just virtue of, of the geography, these like mountainous, rugged, uninhabitable kind of stuff. And then, you know, they're so like uh, one with the elements kind of thing with storm and frost resistance. And they're built for these kinds of areas, but so secluded even that they don't even know about this sort of broad em- empire or something that they're supposedly a part of kind of thing. And like, I, I just thought that's cool, the old stuff. But yeah. Um. Okay. Dean Sheets says here's the spiciest take ever the elf races have the worst law yeah that's just that that's just a shit post right 
<laughs> nah. <sighs> get wrecked. Let's see if there's a way to justify this. Yeah, sure. I mean, a lot of their... I mean, if you're talking about the higher... <sighs> yeah, okay, it's pretty impossible to defend this. I'm trying, but like a lot of it is a cope. And a lot of it is like, I don't know. Yeah, no, the, I've, I've got nothing. Yeah, like the whole birth of like all, all of the, uh, the you know, the Chimer, the Chimer, the... Dude, each of the Elven, like, dude, the Nords... Humans are just actually not. Like, I would say maybe the Red Guards probably have the most unique spin of them so you know just at least mixing in some of the like sort of um japanese kind of like samurai inspirations and then mixing it with like sort of like a a moorish north african kind of middle eastern feel but then outside that it's like imperials arguably some of the earlier interpretations with like with a little bit more interesting stuff in there but imperials like being basically just rome fantasy romans and nords being basically fantasy vikings or you know danes or whatever like they do really riff off closer to what their sort of original, like, pantheon or whatever is. Do you know what I mean? Uh, not original, uh, inspiration is. Do you know what I mean? Like, they are closer to mm. their original inspiration. Whereas if, you know, Dark Elves um, are absolutely just off off the walls by comparison. But, um, you know, even the Wood Elves lore and, even, I mean, even the Orcs and so on, their whole origin story and stuff. And obviously, these are things that are... Um, uh, derivative of like you know lord of the rings and dungeons dragons before <clears throat> and so on like fantasy staple races but i do mm. think the- I- i'm really trying so, i mean i saw a, a slightly hot take because i'm trying to find things that have no likes because i feel like that's where you find the hot takes and in a way i was going to defend this but I, I just did a bit of googling and i can't really defend it but petrus Eckstein says boob armor makes sense if men get crotch armor or ab armor like in real life so obviously, like the idea of having ab armor, it's kind of just for show and whatever. But I mean, the idea of boob armor, if you think about it, would make sense in a world where there's not the same stigma around women fighting. Like historically, battle like yeah. um, the battlefield has been a place for men historically. The, the re- like so, in a in a, de- in a decorative sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but, like, but not and I, in and I, a functional sense. The reason they say the functional is because the way it's sort of built, usually it's so skin tight and plastic, there's mm-hmm. no space for the impact to protect you. So why, like, you know, even on dudes, you know, it's sort of the chest kind of has like a weirder kind of shape or like, or, you know, different plates and so on. It's not like a, you know, muscled ab kind of thing. Unless exactly. you're going like in terms of practicality, terms. I'm reading here... Um, accentuating the breasts in armor creates a large weak point in the cleavage which can be punctured easily so there's a very good chance you get shot straight through the chest if you've got armor that accentuates the breasts and there's like i've even found an image of like a south indian 17th century breastplate that has like proper proper titties on it um and it doesn't look incredibly practical so but to be honest too like you could i mean theoretically if it didn't obscure things but you know you take your classic like grass kind of thing that that's sort of like you know it peeks out a little bit or so on but just attach two boobs to the yeah. to, to the front of it and it wouldn't necessarily in the same way that people I mean, have those ridiculous cod pieces and stuff mm-hmm. for i guess this is what the guy's getting at that it's not but then it would be ceremonial but yeah not, like you'd have to think like only not ceremonial in the sense that it's not practical at all, but in the sense that it would be rarer, right? Like, it's not like every person in the military in armies was wearing ab armor. Yeah, well, yes. that's the thing. There's a big thing about, like, um, you know, there's a real thing in armor. It's just to be intimidating sometimes. That You know, the, there are some very impractical things that made it onto the battlefield purely because it would scare the shit out of the opposition. Yeah, and yeah. and people back Which then and, and throughout do, history, but, you know, and in the Elder Scrolls, really ceremonial gods are really important, and also it's fantasy as well. Like, I mean, look, to be honest, if you're in a realm where like there's things like you know Daedric armor and glass armor and so on, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that they might ceremonially mm. put breast representations on the front or whatever but there is a difference i get what they're getting at but i feel like you can do both in the same way that the the greeks basically gave themselves a six pack on um a bunch of their uh armor or you know yeah. so on. and then I, I feel like it's fair on on i can imagine them coming into battle and there's some like you know queen and maybe if there's any high-ranking like female officers they would have it and then you're kind of run-of-the-mill infantry they don't have it yeah mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, let's have her. 
Oh, this isn't a hot take, but it's a really good take, so I just want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Lotad is Hungry says, They really need to include sub-races of the already existing races. The beast races would have so much more diversity than what we already have available. But I 100% agree, and I think it is something that would be... We, we made a video recently on um, the racial perks for Elder Scrolls Six, or an idea of a perk tree or so on. And obviously my preference is always going to be more diverse races to begin with and I don't mind being a little bit more pigeonholed in but I was sort of like creating a sort of system working off the parameters Skyrim's already made um, but I really like the idea of that you oh no, you know like orc and then you can pick sub race and it's like sort of like a city sort of or city trinimat kind of vibe orc or a stronghold malakath orc or, or you can pick you know if you could be the different race sub races to a degree like obviously you can't be like an alfeek but you could of from the Khajiit, but you could be like the taller variety or, or the sort of smaller variety kind of thing or Argonian. You could easily be like a Naga or something or just, you know, more traditional kind of one. But then also like, you know, you have Clovian or Nibbanese and, you know, the, the, the Nordic ones, you could like East and West or um, Red Guards, Crown Forebears, and they could just be small, like little abilities or, or, or skills and so on that just further allow you to define your character. I think it's, it's a really cool, um, mm idea now i'm gonna take it back to breasts because okay. uh i was just looking at the armors and it's not like they do it on every armor like it is the better armor sets you know that are like rare and special right like i'm having a look mm. now like ebony has it like elven has it but elven is a very ornate looking beautiful mm -hmm. thing if you go look at like iron armor there, it's designed differently. Like it looks like there's a bit more space in the chest area, but it's not like there's two, two spheres hanging off it. I mean, same as steel. Look at what Lydia wears. It's not like there's two spheres hanging off. Like I'm just trying to give them mm. some credit. They didn't put it on, on everything. I mean, steel plate has it a bit too much, <laughs> I think. But like even, yeah, like you know, it's it's. I don't think it's that that severe maybe people are thinking of mods they've seen too much <laughs> i don't know like it's it's on pieces of armor that are rare like glass has it to an extent but again look at what See, glass I wouldn't armor be is i wouldn't be surprised too if if you actually look like a eso and so <laughs> on and this is i guess my critique a lot of eso armors it looks very like close to the skin any armor mm -hmm. even on the guys and so on and like anyway um so and then with the boobs they can be a bit more um pronounced Welcome to oh. the Elder Scrolls Titty Cast. Today we're <laughs> talking about titties again. Booba. Yeah. Um, huh. I'm trying to find. I love watching people seethe about your Elder Scrolls Online armor takes. You make people really. Oh, yeah. you, you, one episode, you'll be like, oh, they're just too, like bulky and over the top like world of warcraft and then you'll be like oh they're just too tight to the body it, like they're just too yeah <laughs> no, I, I, I basically i re-clarified yeah, that and i'm going to re-clarify it for everyone again yeah, here, yeah, yeah. is the best word or what i'm trying to get at is not necessarily like bulky or whatever because some are and some aren't like some of the helmets are big and so on mm -hmm. but it's a manufactured look it looks like it's made in a modern factory it looks mm -hmm. like a cosplay. That's how I'd feel. It doesn't have the sort of like texture or build that looks like it's made by a blacksmith in it. There are exceptions. There are some good armors in ESO, but a lot of your base ones, if you go into the character creator, you flip through the races and you like, oh, heavy armor, layer, and so on. Tell me, I'm, t tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> like, I mean, you will tell me I'm wrong. If you disagree, you just flat out disagree. I can Not already see I the do comments about it, but... talking about Skyrim armors that look like they were made yes, in the Yes, some of them, some of Skyrim's <laughs> armors do as well. But I think on the whole, um, you know, they don't. But uh, let's keep having a look. These aren't hot takes. Eh? These are theories. Yeah, yeah. These are so many are theories. They're just like... Um... <laughs> well, he's a hot take, but we're immediately just going to be like, whatever. But like, uh, Oiva Ner uh, Nermanen. Um, Delphine is actually a real badass, and she deserves more credit for her service as a blade. <laughs> <laughs> Thoughts? Um, <laughs> I think she's just 
straight up it's just kind of i think people don't like because she's annoying but like really she kind of i guess she stole the horn of jürgen windcall which was kind of impressive i guess even though it doesn't i don't know but she just makes dumb decisions man like the whole path the next thing i kind of think is a bit dumb like it's not like she's even had heaps of experience with the dragons uh, do you know what i mean it's like a yeah i don't know <laughs> not sold Mm -hmm. Hot take, though, I guess. I mean, there's, like, not, I there's not much to work with. It's kind of just a poorly written character with a whole lot, not a whole lot going on. So you kind of have to headcanon if she was cool at any point, really. I, I don't know if this is a hot take or not, or maybe it would be more common. But um, I can like literally just say the top, the first line, instead of there's a whole explanation afterwards. But um, Ben Bittinger says, Jigalag is overrated. And I tend to, I basically, I think I, I mostly agree the, in the same way that I think sort of. The reason I don't think he is is because he's not really rated much at all. Nobody really I gives two it, shits about Jigalag, although I, do they? Maybe it's just there's these niche groups but that are just Jigalag fans, but I maybe they're very vocal or something. But I see it a lot. Now like, Jigalag's my favorite prince, and I'm just, to me, it's kind of like. Why? I don't. I don't know. Like, maybe you see it a lot because it stands out as maybe. such a, a unique take to you. Well, maybe because I feel like most people's favorite Daedric princes aren't Jigalag, especially b because he didn't feature in Skyrim at all. It's just like oh, I. I kind of like. I, I was thinking about you know, like you know, I I, I love to be uh, very contrary and with Gorath and so on, and I'm I'm not. He's not my favorite, but I was thinking um, that. A good way of putting it, and I think why he doesn't appeal to me as much, and so on. And it depends, like what you're qualif, like what you're trying to like look for in a god. But here's a hot take: Shea Gorath isn't a good god. He's a good <laughs> character. He's a when you experience him in Oblivion, he's a character. Like for me, uh, like what I find interesting in gods is usually their sphere, their sort of like you know origin stories and stuff like that. Shea Gorath has some of those, to be fair. Like he's not like. I don't think he's a bad god or anything like that. He has one but of the best origin stories of all Daedric princes. What are you talking about? Uh, I don't know. I kind of like... I even kind of like Malakaths <laughs> and stuff more. And like Yeah, there origin, are other but, good ones, but, but it's up there. But the other thing that... Um, so getting, but what's his sphere? What's he represent? I'm a crazy. It's literally anything, kind of. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't have, like, sort of... There's not a feel philosophical depth to Sheogorath. And I guess that's what I enjoy out of a god, because a god is what is worshipped in a religion, which usually has a fair degree of philosophy intertwined with it. Like, if you were to say, what what is the most... Uh, basically, you're just crazy uh, uh, what Sheogorath worship is kind of functioning. But isn't that kind of just saying, like, a sanguine worshipper is just a big heathen? Yeah, and I agree. I'm not. He's not my favorite either. Like, the ones I sort of like are ones that I... Like, for example, I think Marin's Dagon is a really good god because there is such a cool, cohesive philosophy around him and it's understand why he's worshipped and it just kind of... He's the, he's probably don't, the best. You don't, you don't hate... But you don't hate on sanguine. <clears throat> No, no, I you don't. The reason is because, popular. yeah, exactly. No, absolutely. Yeah. If Sanguine yeah. was as overrated as Shea Gorath is, I absolutely yeah. would be like, mm -hmm. "Bro, yeah. he's a little overrated, guys. Chill out." Because people treat him like Shea Gorath, like so. And dude, this is the main thing. Like, if if Shea Gorath wasn't like everyone's like, "Oh my god, cheese for everyone. He's so great." Oh, yeah. Wabberjack, <laughs> Wabberjack. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Care. Exactly. Yeah, it, I agree. Yeah, I agree. But and you know, to be fair to Shea Gorath though, like he's not like. He's got cool stories, like the 16 Accords of Madness and stuff are really cool too. But I just think, you know, especially even the time of Morrowind, no one, until it was Shivering Isles and the sort of like Wes Johnson sort of Scottish whimsical kind of character that you, that you experience, he wasn't, I don't think he'd be anyone's favorite outside of that. Mm. And that's fair enough. But I just feel like if other princes had the same sort of treatment and you got to experience their whole realm and, and everything like that and it was given the same yeah. detail I mean you could say that about lots of things like even Dagon mm. is so much cooler because of the mythic dawn and the experience in Oblivion yeah yeah for sure but like there's Although, just still I feel like Dagon I mean people like him but he he doesn't really get credit for any of the things that make him interesting like I feel no. like most people who like Dagon just like oh yeah destruction oh he's, he's basically the devil yeah, and he, like tears things down but it's like yeah. Well, no, everything about Dagon that's interesting is all the stuff that you don't see in the <clears> games. Or you don't really see unless you read into it. Whereas yeah. Shea Gorath, yeah, like I, you could argue the same for Shea Gorath, but what you do see... I guess see, to me, what, the, 
the the god what interests me about gods is the well like their function as a god as in an idol to be worshipped or or sought after or, or whatever or how they function in a religion that like god and religion is kind of the same thing it's just kind of the argument with like a dwema like they don't see these great beings powerful beings as gods so like technically they could be considered atheist because they don't worship they don't treat things as gods if you understand it's a universal do you think do you think then a god of insanity or madness then just can't work because i feel like the the concept about it that you don't like is just inherent to what it is For, for example like he does have in mania and stuff you know there'll be like some crazy artist or crazy this and and maybe people think that they use their insanity to produce cool things um but th- I'm just trying to think, like, does everything have to be super utilitarian and like, oh, I worship this God because I get a lot of no, use no, no, out no, of No, 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 not utilitarian. Philosophy. It's not about utility at, at, at No, no, of at the all. philosophy, I mean. Like, no, but not even of utility of the philosophy. philosophy. Like, cause you, some people are just brought into philosophies or so on for yeah. different reasons or just born into them or so on. But I just, I guess it is just ultimately, it's like, I find some of the most interesting things about gods is the, is the religions that they spurn after or the beliefs that they go after, whereas... Whereas basically it's just anything goes with Shergoreth. Like if, if, if I was described like what's a cult of Shergoreth look like, it's usually just, oh, we're a bunch of crazies or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't have the same sort of like, you could create really cool cults for basically all of the Daedric princes. Um, and, you know, even Shergoreth, like this is the thing. I'm not like actually like, because I can speak about it. People assume like I'm saying he's the worst. I hate him and so on. I'm just saying it's mainly, I guess, just compared to a lot of the other princes. Um, he, the reason people like Shergoreth so much is because he's a good, like, character and he's really interesting and his realm is cool, like, it's fun and whimsical to talk to and so on. But, um, his actual, like, religions around him or the philosophy, f- philosophies around him aren't, um, interesting to me. But what's the philosophy around Dagon? Oh. Besides, besides the stuff that we know as kind of well, people me, studying the, mythic- the law. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Like all of the Mythic Dawn commentaries and so on, and the idea that he is the sort of like vehicle. I really like some of the Order of the Walking Flame stuff, or some of the ideas that he's the he's the vehicle. For, like some of the Magnus worshippers um, enjoying because to tear down this sort of creation, this world. But I mean, so at the on, end of the day, I guess my point is. And I mean, we just did the and... Mythic Dawn podcast. I understand what his sphere is. I'm just saying, a lot of his followers, their philosophy is very like. I hate the gods. Down with the system. Like it's yeah, it's but not... the mythic dawn cult as a whole is just they really don't cool. understand. The, no, but the ex- that's a, the saying, gods dude, they, they that's just think literally it sounds cool. how many people know <laughs> what's in the Bible. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Christians do not read, not necessarily like read the whole Bible or know it all, and so on. Yeah. So it's the same premise. But if anything, to me, <laughs> that makes it more interesting because it's a realistic levels of like understanding yeah, or so on with course. it, and it makes it a more interesting sort of organization. No. I'm just, uh, yeah. I'm just testing the waters. But yeah, I, I just think all of like, you know, all, I mean, obviously like Azura Boethia Mafala, there's all really cool stuff with. And I um, mean, e- even the way that, you know, even you take the same God and the different interpretations, this is where it can get a little interesting with Shagoreth. But even like, look, let's be real, like Shagoreth and the Khajiit pantheon, it's like, haha, I'm crazy against Skooma Cat. Mm. Let's get wild. Like, it's like, look at me. I'm a little cat with a it, little It can always be boiled fans. down. It can always be boiled down to him just needing his serious side. You know, if if he mm. is if he's bipolar, if he has his manic episodes and he's, he's got his dementia, like wh- whatever. I'm not an expert, but simply be simply having his like uh, the contrast in his character that really doesn't exist. You don't see it much at all. So it's hard to ever take him seriously. So he's fun, but with a god, you kind of want to be able to take them seriously as well. Which I think, da- like to be fair, Dagon, the portrayal of Dagon, his worshippers tend to be more interesting than him because other than the Mysterium Xarxes, which you only see through Mankar's eyes, you would never perceive Meirin's Dagon as being kind of like thoughtful and 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 considering why he's doing things you know like the idea of him actually writing a manifesto versus just swinging his arms around like a lunatic it's like you, you only really see the latter so that there's this poor execution on a lot of gods yeah. i think and by the like by the way you can do both 
you can have both, I think, too. Like, like theoretically, there's arguments to be made that a lot of the gods could have a much better characterization and, and talked about yeah. more. But, like, there is no... Like, for example, I prefer, like, you know, Clavicus Viola and, and Barbus and so on. But their sphere is really good. The dynamic between mm-hmm. the two characters, I think, is really good. But then also, as a god, I can understand how people get into this sort of, like, deal with the devil type thing. It's a really cool um, concept and so on. And, and cults around like a sort of but i mean Sh- shivering isles has the the zealots and all the but, lore about arden soul and yeah. what really happened uh, to and- be honest i kind of think that's a little weak i'm not that the whole arden soul thing like dude but I- compare it to cults remember. of other daedric princes that you don't know a single thing about yes but what i'm saying is yes like you you could theoretically like anything could be made a good job of but it's like what's the yeah. zealots philosophy outside of this sort of like it's like a Oh, we we truly believe this through Shigarath or the other one, like the heretics or whatever, that it's Art and Soul was or whatever. I forgot. Mm, but but name name a cult to Clavicus file and what their philosophy. Yeah, I know. Is. I'm not saying that they yeah, exist yeah. or something. I'm not like right. it's not like oh really? Name me an example. It's not like no, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's that they could be or, or do you know what I mean? Or like the ones that do exist, like the mythic dawn, or not necessarily a cult, but like the entire religions formed around um, the the different Daedra in. in um, in Khajiit, they're there elsewhere and Morrowind and with the Reachmen and so on. Like, I find them infinitely more interesting. I, I think of the God, I, I guess it's just that, like, gods to me, I like them to feel like gods. Here's a hot distance. take. So, here, let's hear a hot Here's take. Here's a hot, well, not really, but perhaps the reason you don't like it is because Bethesda actually went and executed it. And so you got this huge Shea Gorath what? sandwich, and all your execution ideas for the other gods that are yet to happen are cooler. Than what Bethesda actually did I, with the Shivering Isles. With Shivering Isles, by the way, this is a thing, and especially as a kid, like I really like it. And it's like even now, like he's a good character. I wouldn't want him to disappear. And the Shivering Isles is a really cool DLC and so on. So I wouldn't say it's so much um, the execution, but I, I almost do think it is kind of like Sheogorath. It's partly the execution. Like he could have other more serious, darker sides emphasized, but it is also, and you know, it can be a little meme cheese, whimsical kind of stuff that you know, a bit, but, um, it's, it's that as a concept, I guess I'm not as sold on him as a God. Like he's a leprechaun basically. Like that's kind of what, <laughs> what Shagorath is and so on. And that's a cool whimsical character, but th- theoretically, you know what I mean? Like you could kind of take him as a character somewhere and I he know doesn't have mean. to be a God. He could be a whimsical character on the side. Like, a do you know mm. what I mean? Like, a like some kind of magical... But I guess he kind of has to be like that because as someone who represents madness, it's a very subjective kind of mortal thing. that You don't understand other entities mad... Like, if someone says madness, you think of a human psyche that's yeah. that's nuts. I feel like I've derailed this time. <laughs> so anyway, Shake hot right take. Bring in an hot take. I'm going to get so much shit for that. <laughs> No, you're not. Yeah, I am. I think, I think there's... It's it, the controversial podcast. You'll have... Everyone will agree. No, they won't. All right, all it's right. It's reverse right. psychology. I'm trying to think really? of my own controversial take to just kind of nuke the podcast with, but I'll keep my Worst game and you, most stupid law since Pong by you, Nick's Trendy. I, I feel like you absolutely have, have some, like, hot takes buried, buried away in there. I d- yeah, definitely. But at the same time, I feel like the easiest one, the easiest thing to shit on with Elder Scrolls is ESO because it's the most recent and it's the most in the spotlight. And I don't want to keep doing that. So I'm trying to think of it, horrible things it, to say about the other games. Did we say this already in the last episode? But I mean, it's posted as a comment on the last episode. So maybe we didn't. But um, oh, they've used some fancy font. One sec. <laughs> is it that cursed font? I think it says Teladonis the Law Seeker. Anyway, unpopular opinion. The high fantasy rendition of Cyrodiil in Oblivion is so good and has such a unique vibe that I don't care that they had to slaughter its previous law for it. Sorry, so starting again that Cyrodiil is... Basically, the high fantasy setting of Cyrodiil is so good that he doesn't care that they had to slaughter previous law to do that instead. I guess, you know what? Can I, can I actually, like, here's a question, and it's hard to, like, hit a ground because they're all sort of quite nebulous terms anyway. But is it high fantasy? Or is it just very, like, bright and, like, sort of whimsical? Because it's pretty I think that's what, he, like, that's what he means. High fantasy means. to me, I guess, like what I would say is if an idea of a low fantasy is something that doesn't have a lot of magic and mythological stuff, so something like Game of yeah. Thrones, all of those pieces are rare, but it's very, like, rem- reminiscent of, like, what a, like, kind of real medieval experience might be. 
versus something that's truly high fantasy. So if you took Morrowind, it's like, oh, we're walking around on giant tech I'd almost bug call kind that weird things. fantasy as opposed to high fantasy. I, 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 would, yeah. I would call Oblivion high fantasy purely because of the abundance of magic. Yeah, sure, yeah. And I guess that's the Elder Scrolls series as a whole. It's There's like a imps. higher fantasy. But like, what do you... You take out the imps of the tipping point, Scott. You take out the wild imps, it's not high fantasy <laughs> anymore. You've got to have the yeah. imps. But anyway, but yeah, but I guess his it... point is, in in general, is that the the setting of Oblivion, whatever we want to call he it... He doesn't care that it's is gone better. from weird mm. fantasy to Look, I'll, I'll a take traditional... it a step further. I think Oblivion is just a cheap, shitty version of Two Worlds. <laughs> Did you ever play Two Worlds? Oh, I vaguely remember, like, I vaguely remember reading about it in, a, in like, one of those old Xbox magazines and so on and looking, oh, maybe you want to get... Because isn't that a terrible game in it's, terms of, yeah, it's like... it's god awful. <laughs> but to yeah. be honest, I only played a little bit of it at a friend's house. And then I watched a speed run of it recently and it took, like, f- five minutes, I think. But then oh, again, It's actually funny, though. I'm looking at it now, the biome, though. The biome does look quite similar. I, th- I think Two Worlds was areas. a straight rip of Oblivion. I'm, if I oh, know my, lore, my IRL lore well enough. Uh, I've, I'm seeing a lot of big palm trees here, though, that don't look like Oblivion Shit, at all. Maybe it does but... a better job of kind of like a tropical... Cyrodiil they were trying they were they were trying to do. I mean, look, Oblivion's environment, everything and for the time and so on is all very um, enjoyable. Um, but... Um, no, I still prefer the like crazier thing. As a kid, and this isn't some, I uh, this isn't some like uh, um, elitist like I'm older now, wankery or so on. But like I've personally, and I think it just comes down to taste thing. But I've always been drawn to really weird looking thing. Like my favorite, you know, like that's why I think what really got me with like Star Wars, like the cantina kind of scenes and Tuscan Raiders and all of that kind of different looking stuff. And I think that's what grabbed me about Morrowind when I first played it. It's like, it looks so interesting. Like movies like um, Dark Crystal and, and and stuff like that. And just anything that's a little bit, I really, I've, I really like, um, like a lot of like puppets, like even mm-hmm. if you know, like movies like um, uh, The La- uh, Labyrinth with like David Bowie and, and, um, I forgot the girl's name. Jennifer Connelly, anyway. I think. Yeah, Jennifer yeah. Connelly, yeah. But like those kind of, how it has that kind of really weird kind of uncanny mm-hmm. element and parts. But I've always been a big fan of that kind of um, look of things. Um, and I, I generally, if something's a little bit different or alien kind of worlds, but I really like fantasy as well. So I don't, I, and I like where they intersect basically. But yeah. Mm-hmm. We need another hot take. Hmm. Um, okay um, the, elves, the elves look awful in every game Except Elder Scrolls Online By average thing I like in Joya I think that's the difference between liking like, And I, I think I generally do prefer the more Alien look or something a little bit different looking Versus the sort of humans with ears look But it's just a taste thing I guess right Come on hit us with another hot take um, I need my fish. <laughs> this is a hot day. I just want to. Oh, it's not really hot day. Fish gaming. If you think about it, orcs are objectively the worst race ever, <laughs> as they're actually mutated by a pile of Poethia's poop. They also worship a guy who got beaten up, eaten, and crapped out on the dirt, who went then on to be the angriest guy in the oblivion. <laughs> I think by definition that would be subjective. <laughs> like I, yeah. I mean. What the wor- using the term worse there is very broad, like, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to go to to bat for the orcs, but I don't know. I think they're the, I think they're one of the more one of the more interesting races, which should give some brownie points. Yeah, um, I mean, I did see one yeah. where someone was like, "This is fairly basic," but someone was really. I've closed it now, so I can't name who it was, but was really keen on the Dwemer returning and being like the focus and it essentially being as if they just all rematerialize as if nothing had happened. But I feel like we can shoot that one down instantly because it's just like, no, we don't, we don't want that. I feel like it's like the Dwemer. It's like the reality of knowing them. They're just all like this sort of, I don't know. I mean, it plays into kind of, it's a bit of the, it's been a bit of a theme with this podcast is that the more you put, something under the microscope the less interesting and magical it has become in the elder scrolls it it does happen that way like some of some of the most beloved parts of the lore 
are the things we don't know a great deal about you know like say akavir as well or you know and the fact that there's and so many mysteries surrounding the dwemer it's, it's kind of like fantasy's job too it's like to inspire wonder and like kind of like kind of tying back to what we were kind of talking about before about the idea of truth but it's just like if you know the indisputable truth of what happened at red mountain and all of that kind of stuff it becomes less interesting what is more interesting is all the theories about it like you know it's why like a lot of those um you know ancient history theorists and so on and why that becomes more interesting is because you know less about it less concrete and it becomes such a oh could this have happened maybe that uh, happened and like you know a, a magician never reveals his truth yeah exactly um and that's a big part part of um the once you know how magic tricks done it is not interesting <laughs> You just yeah, don't lose it. Not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, I think yeah. honestly, I think one of the hottest takes, which I'm not going to necessarily say I disagree with, but one of the hottest takes I've ever seen in the Elder Scrolls community, I think came from you, Scott, in the form of a video where you said Elder Scrolls is, I, can't, I, I don't want to misquote it, so you correct me, but it's yeah. the greatest world building of anything ever. Is that essentially what you said? Uh, yeah, oh, I mean, I have a video. Yeah, universe. it's my the the greatest fantasy universe to me, and I think in terms well, of well, take world the to building, me out of it and defend it. To me, yeah, or ever. Too. just say. Oh, just I say would just it say is. it is the most. Um, it, it is built because of the nature of it, and even like arguably, like absolutely, it's because of lazy writing here and there, or people have different ideas and so on. But the realistic thing is, is that that creates a far more believable it's it's a far better one-to-one -one with our world in terms of the believability things the unreliable narrator and all of the the wonder and, and the different ideas about things like if you go through cultures throughout the um throughout our history like certain cultures will have different ideas about history and world and time and and and, and gods and so on and it just creates such a a patchwork of of the Elder Scrolls world you can't understand, which is how we understand reality. It's just a matter of fact, before cameras and video, we, and, and photos, we are basically working off, you know, written word and, and stuff like that. Um, and then that becomes in itself like a, a you know, a big abundance of, of um, biases and so on. And you're creating this sort of patchwork to kind of like build somewhat tapestry of history, but there's holes everywhere. There's bits that don't make sense. And it's like, you're holding a piece and it's like, this doesn't even look like it fits, but it is from this thing that says this, like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it just, and I think that no other fantasy universe creates that the same because most come from an authoritative um, perspective yeah so even for example lord of the rings which, which is where it's, you're going to get great. the most pushback is from that community yeah but lord of the rings it's here's your bible it's called the Silmarillion. this is exactly what happened bang there you go and here's the story bang there you go which mm -hmm. is fine it's like that's how lots of things are told and so on but that is not representative of like what our like real world experience is so the uh, for me the big appeal to it and what makes it so great and so compelling is elder scrolls is that it is kind of like everywhere there is so much of a mishmash of different um, things, an unreliable narrator, and there's wiggle room for theories and so on. Like, I'm sure there's Lord of the Rings theories in gaps and stuff. Um, and, you know, same as there are in... Um, uh, well, I, I think I... So you probably know this, like Song of Ice and Fire uses unreliable narrator mm -hmm. somewhat, I guess. Um, but yeah, it generally, I just think the unreliable narrator is such a cool um, world. And the other thing I also like because of, which is obviously less realistic but things like dragon breaks and inbuilt metaphysical concepts that can support retconning and stuff like that it gives the world such a like continued existence and so on but in a believable way it's not like the jarring like oh here we are um star wars we're eliminating all of the expanded universe and we're starting again like that's very like jarring and mm. sort of upsetting whereas if there's just an Elder scroll six it just builds on top of this and this and this and this and it just it just feels the most organic to me. Because I, I think when I sat down and it thought about it, <laughs> it just works. When I sat down and thought about it, it's like, you know, you've got Lord of the Rings being an obvious contender. And for me personally, Song of Ice and Fire is like the, I'd probably say I know as much or more about that law than I do about Elder Scrolls law. But then when I thought about it, I was like, yeah, I really can't argue that it is the most in-depth world building of a fantasy universe. And, it, and it, even if there's more stuff that isn't, quite as well done and there are conflicts and whatnot simply the fact it has been so kind of open source compared to the single-mindedness of george martin's world or tolkien's world it it, <laughs> it just allows it to be it, yeah the, the, it's it's several levels deeper i think honestly. The, I, I i guess the real red pill is that there's like a lot of um the most collaborative 
uh, world building often turns out to be the best because most people would go like, oh, look at our real world. <laughs> Get into real life world building. It's like, yeah, okay, go back and look at mythologies and all of this kind of stuff. Incredibly collaborative. They did not have these big authoritative mm-hmm. sources and so on that were like this and this. Even something that tries to, like the Bible, it's like, oh, well, here comes the New Testament. Bang, there's a whole new book we've ad- added to it. And then at that, there's so many different interpretations and all of that kind of stuff and, and additions and addendums and, and, and mm-hmm. translations and that was what really creates an interesting thing rather than, you know, there's the Silmarillion, it's the one, the only, and it's definitive. I like it. It's very enjoyable, but it doesn't make it feel um, as, you know, Mm -hmm. real. I don't know. Like, you know, when something feels real, it's something that tricks you. That, Like, you know, we sit here right now as a podcast talking about Elder Scrolls, like historians, like analyzing something completely fictitious, but you just... You, in, you can do that with other things to a degree. You can regurgitate the information that is known for certain, but there's no real like, oh, does Boethia mean this or that? Or was Lorcan this or that? Or, or you know, do the, did Riemann really come crackers or whatever the hell is he's all like <laughs> recovered, like that kind of stuff I, I just think open source is such a cool thing and it's probably a very modern idea that runs against it, which is very it's a uh, it's a, a very financial oriented thing. It's like copyright. Like, like imagine someone copyrighted the Bible back in two thousand, uh, back in like, you know, when it was made. You know, two thousand years ago or whatever. Um, you know what I mean? Like, it's it's that sort of thing where it's because nobody can reinterpret and add and change. And I don't know. I just lo- I like the organic growth of things, and I find it very interesting in history and culture and so on. Looking at how certain beliefs and ideas sort of organically grow through mixes of things and yeah i just think elder scrolls it's pretty cool all right yeah yeah so good but um i feel like michael's raring to go with a hot take <laughs> oh okay oh, sorry. I thought you you're were... just raring to go <laughs> 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 <I'll put> you... <laughs> <laughs> all right michael um, you're on the spot give us a hot take yeah, um, what's your uh, hottest take yeah. michael Oh, like me personally. Yeah, you like, personally. Like, what do you or... think would rustle the most, Jimmy's? Think about it for a second while oh. I just comment on guys on this on this podcast in particular. Get down into the comments below, and we want hot takes, as in they inspire controversy. Like, if you think I'm saying this thing, and I'm pretty sure eighty percent of people agree with it, it's not a hot take. Yeah. We want to be glad that the dislike bar is gone. That's how bad we want it to be. Because yeah. <laughs> we want you to put us in positions where we have to really like, you know, discuss and talk these things and out ourselves as people who disagree with you. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I can't. You uh, can't. I feel like, well, I mean, I've, I've said a lot of hot takes and I've said a lot um, like, well, not hot takes, but my personal takes on things. I'm, I, I, I do share them. And I'll make entire videos about them. So I'm, I'm just trying to think. Re- quite one quite. thing too, I'll, I'll just add. We should um, clarify. Guys, keep them um, a little bit more law oriented because in law takes and stuff and subjective things about that. Because to a degree when like there's a lot of comments here that it's like, oh, you know, like it's not actually a good role playing game or actually custom spells will work and all of these kinds of things. It's like they're cool, but you kind of, they get, I don't know, boring discussing the gameplay things after a while. Um, but yeah, so just keep them, I guess, more law oriented. What's the- <laughs> uh, I just ca- I can't think of anything legit. I can only think of things that are just like jarring and silly. Like my father's just a bit of a boring spider, right. Daedric <laughs> prince, and like it really is just like you play up all these elements oh, well, of he- like like what she's about, he- but really he- in reality she's just a big spider. You're- I'm just trying to prod you bro There's, well here i've actually got um something that could inspire a bit of discussion he's a hot take i'll pretend to it's not necessarily a hot take 100 percent i'm all for but it's like i kind of like can imagine someone else saying it i'm going to say it and then i'm going to somewhat agree with it okay so the hot mm-hmm. take is um i think elder scrolls being derivative is to its benefit not to its detriment a lot of people go like oh, I really like, um, you know, X, Y, Z thing when they go really crazy with the world building. But I think part of the reason it's also a great universe is the it being derivative in areas and then expands upon it in its own way and so on helps ground people in things. If I, it's like if I was starting a, new, a story or something and I say to you, harpy, this is a harpy or something. In your real life understanding, you have something to attach to and it helps you understand the word 
quicker, world quicker, sorry. And then when you want to introduce new ideas or like, oh, harpies in this world do this or so on, it's very easy to accept. Where if I say, oh, here's the Xinthanthopoplith, right? Some like crazy like animal name. You're already trying to wrap your head around that. And now then you basically end up describing, oh, it's a harpy essentially in short or something like that. That you're, you're adding barriers between a person's understanding. It's much easier if you can go, oh, horse. Whereas if you have some like complex kind of thing or and you know if you can say like oh horses have five legs in this world or whatever that's easier information to take on later rather than constructing what is a yeah. functionally horse or something different obviously there's always mm. exceptions and so on I, right but it's the same reason like you know using orcs or minotaurs or stuff like that i but, feel like yeah. it's impossible to have true to truly have fantasy without that you know i i don't think i could ever think of an example where i mean obviously nothing is original nothing is mm. truly original but elder scrolls I'd argue does one of the best jobs at, at seeming completely original to the point where it can actually be difficult to see where the inspiration comes from unless you have a lot of experience in a lot of different areas and you know a lot of things like um well, you can, they're much less obvious about it and then when they do one. they take Sorry, it in God. really different directions using the orcs as an obvious example they are very unlike orcs traditionally in fantasy well if you even take if you look at something like i guess probably the ones that they could call out easiest would be something like Nords. Like Nords is like very just riffing off, you know, Scandinavian sort of um, lore. <laughs> it's funny to use lore as a real world <laughs> thing, but like using, um, and using that, and they are really just kind of Vikings or so on, but it's the interesting way. Like, so what I find is cool is using magical kind of things to, to make stereotypes kind of work. Like obviously the imagined stereotype of a Conan the Barbarian sort of like, you know, rugged kind of thing and then throw it in the, in the, in the northern frozen wastelands or whatever you can make that work and you know they're like barbarian armies without siege engines kind of you know just get owned by some walls but if you can blow down walls with um your very voice or so on and like all of the elemental things, it's, it's basically i feel like it's almost like you can if you have what elder scrolls does well a lot of the times is it takes the stereotype or the, the, the derivative but then makes it sort of weird and interesting by actually doubling down on that stereotype and amping it up. Obviously, Nord's representation in Skyrim was dialed down, but if you read like the Pocket Guide to the Empire and stuff, it takes that sort of like imagined idea of it and then just turns it to 100. And then you get these, you know, immune to the frost sort of elemental kind of Nords that, you know, have a, have a sky god and they breathe in and shout down words and so on. Like the classic barbarian scream, oh, whatever. Mm -hmm that is emphasizing that I'm going to blow down your walls with that. Like it's taking things and making a, a hyperbole of it. Yeah, it's like advancing society and technologies realistically depending on what this culture actually has access to. Yeah. So, you know, theoretically, uh, a culture can be comp so vastly different based on these small differences between them. You know, like, I mean, yeah. a, a small real world example that we, I think we've talked about before is that, you know, I think the, the abundance of porcelain use in china in china prevented the 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 discovery of lens grinding for a long time so that it it, it almost contributed to stagnating yeah. a little bit because people were losing their eyesight earlier and were less able to contribute to the society etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's well, interesting seeing how things develop based on what technologies what materials and what powers in the in a fantasy setting you use well that's the thing too and especially it depends on the time of society like obviously now we get innovation just because you can sell things and stuff like that but like in earlier times in history innovation is often driven by a need or some sort of niche so you know with um with porcelain and so on they a lot of that area just sort of filled that niche they don't need to discover glass because they filled it in a different in a different way um and then therefore if you're not searching for the answer mm -hmm because there is nothing. Whereas some, some other things you might go like, oh, you know, like a glass or whatever. And then therefore you see all these other applications or so on that can be done from that. But you know, you know what I'm getting at. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's interesting because there's not just a one sort of one track technological growth kind of thing. Like if you, a good example is like, you know, look at um, even the, the Aztecs and so on. Like they've got all of this, they're building a city and a lake and they've got like mm. aqueducts and all of that stuff. But at the same time, they don't have metal working really. Like, you know, um, they're using wooden clubs with obsidian jammed in it. Like, it's just, but, you know, it's like, oh, Roman aqueducts kind of level stuff, but you've got like, you know, um, stone and wooden weapons. So it's it's interesting to see that like 
technological difference and how it's not just a one-way mm. progression. Okay. I mean, it's funny how it's still happening too. Yeah. Like we don't, we don't know what other cultures ex- exist on other planets, but we may look funny to aliens that we've got this really, really good internet yeah. and computing and stuff, but then don't have something else, which they kind of made at the same time. We got it's kind of like looking at Fallout. <laughs> Oh my. Yeah, like look out Fallout and how that universe basically like what was it they didn't make the microchip, so all the computers and yeah, stuff were like I super was... old school. Like it's it's a nice play on tech. T- uh, I think I saw a TikTok recently. There was a guy I was telling you about a car, <laughs> oh, yeah. right? That 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 Americans were America was late to getting chips in their credit cards or something like that. But basically, they can't just transfer money using like their bank or whatever. They use Venmo and like, and cash apps and stuff as well. But like that they couldn't just, people can tell me about it in the comments, I'm sure. But you can't just go, oh, open your banking app and go, boop, send it from bank to bank. you mean now? Oh no, you can I think now, it's slow, surely. like now it's come in, oh, but okay. I think it was wow, a while or in parts. Like, I don't know. I, it was a TikTok I saw recently hmm. or someone. It was someone having a culture shock f- coming yeah. from America to, I think they were in like, finland or something and then traveling and so mm. on but but sometimes you just you, you're not actually fully aware of all of the the different mm. things i don't know people can tell me if that's a meme that i got tiktok memed <laughs> but yeah <laughs> but they it, just, it's well they just genuine. i think they just pay each other in 19 dollars Fortnite cards <laughs> <laughs> yeah um uh, who wants it <laughs> <laughs> we, we've come so far from the hot takes the, hot, the yeah. hottest take of this video is calling it the hot takes episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this, uh, this isn't a hot... T- um, Ranger Rizzo says, As much as I love The Elder Scrolls, the lore is better than the games themselves. I'd rather read about the lore than play any Tez game. Agree. Per- that's just um, me. That's I, just me. I, I re- well, I really like the games, but I still rather read about lore and theorize about lore more than the games but i have to say that is because i've played skyrim mm. thousands of times and morrowind and oblivion like i've done it to death so the point where it's naturally going to take it like i imagine when elder scrolls 6 comes out i'm going to be like way into playing the game if that makes sense. yeah it, for sure and i think that's fair like yeah yeah i i think i'm it's not more in love with the lore now than the games because yeah i just kind of get tired i i like a ton of genres i i play a lot of games so i just generally stop playing older games but i still like maintain my love for the elder scrolls because of the lore um so like i'm almost in elder scrolls 6 i'm excited obviously to play it and i'm excited to have a new playground to make videos in um you know casually and for work but i am also just really excited to see what new additions come to the to the gods and to to certain characters and what what new lore comes about that's like 50 percent of the excitement for me for elder scrolls 6 do you want to hear uh there is a hot take i found there's two hot takes um i think we could finish up with the the two hot takes all right we've got um santi bahina says the uh whoops sorry wrong person (laughs) uh you got duped um shadow dx 2.0 says oblivion's main story is more annoying than skyrim what do you mean by more annoying like just annoying, like frustrating to complete, I guess, like just as a mm. whole. Which uh, so Oblivion's is more frustrating to complete. Yeah. Well, I, I'd annoying. say, um, like it's less enjoyable like it's, as functionally as like part of that. I would have mentioned like. I feel like it's feels a bit longer. I don't know if that's just a thing in my head. Or Skyrim's like more is pretty steps. quick. Having played the Skyrim, the... you can smash through Skyrim's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Skyrim's is pretty quick, and it kind of. I prefer Oblivion story. I think the characters and people like Parthenax is a yeah. good exception, but um, yeah. But annoying is the is the word. Yeah. Uh, what what does annoying mean? Uh, they shouldn't be annoying unless you feel like a need to like you have to complete it on a certain character just because. But I usually will just avoid it if I don't want to play it. I just won't yeah. play that main story. I mean, so. the main story of Skyrim. Like if you're just doing the main story, you only have to fight a couple of drag like there's there's like three mm-hmm. dragon fights total. Um and part of the interesting part of the story is just the civil war stuff, which you could argue isn't even a part of it anyway. So there's practically nothing to the main story of Skyrim. To enjoy it, you kind of have to get 
you have to explore the world and fight a bunch of dragons and things like that. I'm trying to actually think of how many dragons or how close that is. Well, there's the one. There's the one in White so Run. There's the White Run one. You do defeat. There's the Kynes um, Grove one. Yeah, and yeah, then there's you defeat Alduin twice. Ving. Yeah, and you have but to there defeat is also, Oda Ving to capture him. You don't really when have to do to... anything though. You don't have to fight him. I guess theoretically this you is in a. S- you just trap him. Oh, you don't have to fight him. No, you, you just you just trap, trap him in White Run. Um, you can basically but, go down and just walk up. You'll breathe fire at you, whatever. But you're just walking back. Uh, I remember dealing damage in the process. Yeah, you don't but, have to at all. You just walk okay. in basically. I mean, you still. But you're still with a there dragon. is another one that I think was basically so close to always there. The one out the front when you first go to Cloud Ruler Temple when you're like going mm-hmm. in there. There's a burial that's like so close, but the dragon's already out. Like basically, so. I'm not sure if it's necessarily central or whatever, but you like always end up fighting. And there's one at Skull Dragon as well. Yeah, yeah, hold on. Oh, you, don't, you don't have hold to fight on. it, but it's there. Oh, yeah, but yeah, it's thrown <laughs> at you. Like, I was going to say Cloud Ruler Temple. Oh, you, sorry. Yeah. Oh, Sky sorry. Haven. I meant Sky Haven is yeah. what I meant. Yeah. I was like, wait, no, <laughs> that's surely the Oblivion right. one, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, it's a hot take, I guess. I don't know. I feel like to make that take, you have to just not really enjoy playing Oblivion. If you, like, I don't know. I feel like it's the only reason to not like the main quest or playing it is because you just don't really feel like playing the game. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. What's what's the other hot take? So Johnny B three three, Serana is the most overrated, annoying character in the game. <laughs> she was designed for fourteen year old boys to fawn over. Edgy anti theist commentary slagging off Gelabor for following Oriel, thinking it's some hot take hates her parents but only superficially has a sassy remark about everything you come across she's also <laughs> this guy goes on a rant so I <laughs> yeah, don't, 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 get the whole thing out <laughs> she's also unrealistically unaffected by being in solitary confinement for hundreds of years she should be barely able to speak does vampirism stop your muscles from seizing up or shouldn't she be blood star- in a blood-starved frenzy like the Grey Prince's dad in Oblivion? Why doesn't she hate her mum more for imprisoning her? Why doesn't uh, why couldn't they have an Elder Scroll somewhere and uh, and then hidden in the soul can together? Uh, that was a bit of a mess up. But imagine someone traps you in a stone coffin for the sake of a mortality balance and then put you on a hydration drip, gives you a catheter, waste bag, etc. Then some random stranger rescues you after a month. You've been in pitch black darkness and no signs or sounds alone with your thoughts. How long before you go insane? How are you going to feel towards the person who trapped you there? Aren't you going to be slightly traumatized? Oh, well, vampires are immune to PTSD, I hear you say. Well, what about when Serana was originally turned into a vampire? I think she's still pretty traumatized by that still. The answer to all these questions, poor bleep shitty writing the random speech animations jesus christ the random speech animations her and her parents okay sure she's poorly written and she wobbles around on the spot like a tool but she's great in battle where did you come from resurrects goat done and done where did you come from resurrects draga done and done and he repeats that a few kind of time the whole done and done thing such a deep misunderstood person man don't you wish you could marry her Nobody over the age of 16 says that. <laughs> Real men marry Borgak the Steelheart. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <Based. laughs> I just... I, more of this energy, guys, by the way. Yeah, like, that, very that convicted, funny. like, I hate it. Like, that's what's funniest, <clears throat> like, to... Really? It doesn't have to be that long. No, like, <laughs> that energy was good. Oh, yeah. uh, no, I like that one. I mean, it's fair enough. Like, here's the dialogue when, when you kind of like, when she comes out and you kind of like, I was expecting someone, like me at least. Can't you tell from looking at me? A vampire. And then she's like, you go, why were you locked away? She goes, that's complicated. And I'm not totally sure if I can trust you. But if you want to know the whole story, help me get back to my family's home. My name is <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, I, I, I kind of agree. Like, I don't have the sort of burning desire of hatred, but some things do annoy me about Serana's character that I don't like that she is like they basically she's supposed to be from like first before the first era kind of things because the idea of a and or, or early first era like that Cyrodiil is the seat of an empire. Um, or she just wasn't aware of the Elysian one and interregnum kind of time or something like that. But she's wearing clothes that look really like modern or fit to, to the sort of time period. Like you're talking like some like Nedic tribe sort of level time and mm-hmm. like, you know, before Pelinor and Mora House and so on. And she's, do you know what I mean? Like it looks like, and then, cause I think oh, doing the, the let's play recently, she was, cause she talks to 
I think she's not surprised. I forgot what it was. She's not surprised when she meets Gelibor or something or Snow Elf or, or like she's just very aware of them, which implies again really early. So there's no like, oh, just a little bit of a confusion. I don't know. It's just. The- I'll admit she could have been way more interesting. Yeah. With way more to say. But uh, anyway, but, I suppose yeah. that brings us to the end of uh, this Hot Takes episode. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all for watching and enjoying our discussion and our tangents and all of that. And definitely put those hot takes in the comments below. Please. Very hot, very spicy. Yeah. Man, we'll all do right. More. And uh, we look forward to nerding out with you again next time.